This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to our service of worship for this day as we join together to pray and to sing and to hear God's word for us today. We hope you feel welcome wherever you are joining us from today, whether here in the sanctuary or joining us online. A few quick announcements as we get started this morning. Um, the second installment of our book and brunch for this summer is following worship today. We're going through the book Poverty by America. You're welcome to join us if you have read the book or if not. There's always plenty of um, fun discussion, uh, maybe not fun. There's always lots of good discussion around um, the topics that are covered in the book. Um, next, uh, you'll notice as you came in a board outside with uh, various little pieces of paper on them. Those are some places that we need some donations for our upcoming Vacation Bible School. Um, all the instructions are right there on the board if you want to grab some things and drop them back off here uh, by the indicated date. Um, this coming Tuesday, uh, our book group is continuing through their book, uh, You Were Made for This Moment. They are meeting at 1.30 on Tuesdays um, and will meet throughout the rest of July. And then Tuesday evening is the second part of the sequel for Anne of Green Gables. Um, we'll be joining in the fellowship hall for dinner and the rest, huh? Wednesday. Wednesday. Yep, you're right. Wednesday. <laughs> Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. Thank you. I just, yep, that's what it says everywhere, but right here in, in my note. So. Everyone else is right. Six o'clock on Wednesday, uh, Anne of Green Gables, the sequel, part two, um, if you'd like to join for that. And then um, if you're uh, looking ahead into August, which is not that far away, um, on August the 10th, we have a group outing for the loons. Um, we'll be going together. You can contact the office to reserve your tickets. They are $12.50 a piece for a box ticket. Uh, the game is at 7 o'clock that evening. There are fireworks following that game. Um, so please make those reservations, and we'll look to see you at the ballpark on August the 10th. As we begin our worship service this day, let us pause for a moment of prayer. Generous God, you come to us again and again no matter how late it is in the day or in our lives. Calling to us, gathering us in, you give us your good work to do, your, our daily bread, and your boundless grace. Increase in us a generous spirit so that we may do your work with joy alongside others whom you also love. We celebrate your salvation not only in our lives, but also in the lives of other people, even those we had not imagined would be included in the kingdom that you are bringing about. God, align us with your ways and help us to receive your gifts of justice and mercy and compassion as good news for us all. It's in Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Good morning. Those that are comfortable standing are invited to do so as we join in our call to worship. Whether we embrace God's call in our lives or try to avoid it, God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Whether we are long timers or latecomers in the life of faith, God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Whether our lives in Christ are comfortable or bring hardship, God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. We praise God's name forever and ever.
Because we do not always live our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, we confess before God and one another our sin and our shortcoming. In repentance, let us turn towards God's grace and mercy. Let us pray together. God of abundant goodness, we confess that we want your grace for ourselves, but like Jonah, often wish punishment or exclusion on others. We judge the efforts and motives of others while ignoring the faults of our own. Forgive us, we pray, when we let jealousy overtake us. Forgive us, we pray, when we are petty, even in the presence of your generosity. Forgive us, we pray, when we feel slighted by you. May we ask once again for your mercy. Will you help us to be more merciful toward one another? We pray in the name of Jesus by whose grace we are saved. Amen. God extends mercy beyond our deserving and grace beyond our ability to earn it. God has granted us the privilege of Therefore, we will live as grateful and forgiven people. Thanks be to God. holy wisdom, let us seek God's shalom, the peace and the welfare of one another as we share signs of peace with Christ, with one another, in Christ's peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. Please share signs of peace. I hope you never feel too rushed to get back to your seats. We're just always ready for when everyone's seated and we will continue. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Gracious God, your word surprises and challenges. It upsets and overturns our way of seeing and thinking. Come and find us today wherever we are, however we are. By the power of your Holy Spirit, cause that which is withering in us to blossom, that which is exacting in us to broaden until we see as you see, and thereby glimpse the kingdom that you are bringing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning we're going to go through the book of Jonah one that we often teach to our Sunday school children, 
um, leaving out some of the parts we're going to touch on this morning. So whenever I do like this, kids, just cover up your, your ears. No. Um, the story of Jonah roams and fluctuates from theme to theme and place to place about as much as Jonah himself does throughout the story. Today's focus is going to be on how the story ends, but before we get there, I want to remind us of how Jonah got to this part when we get to chapter 4. We are first introduced to Jonah, and he's minding his own business in the small town that he's from, in Israel's northern kingdom, not far from the Sea of Galilee. He lives in a border town, vulnerable to the lurking threat of the mighty Assyrian Empire. The book begins by saying, The Lord's word came to Jonah, saying, Get up and go to Nineveh, crying out against it, for their evil has come to my attention. Now, much has been written about just how evil these Assyrians are. The book of Nahum calls Nineveh a city of bloodshed, filled with plunder from the many nations that they have conquered. Historian Richard Gabriel writes, Assyria emerged as the most powerful military empire that the world had ever seen, built on military force and policy terror. Between the years of 890 and 640 BCE, a span of 250 years, the Assyrians fought 108 major and minor wars, punitive expeditions, and other significant military operations against neighboring states. Assyria's reputation for bloodshed was well deserved, and by admission of its own kings, here we're going to cover our ears, with their blood I dyed the mountain like crimson wool, declared one emperor. I made a pile of heads and the living I impaled. So this is the evil that has come to the Lord's attention. This is where God is directing Jonah to go. Now in Jonah's mind, there was nothing good, nothing salvageable about these Assyrians. He was sure that it would be a waste of time for him to go there and try to talk some sense into them, to try to change them because they weren't going to listen. Besides that, he didn't want them to have a chance to be redeemed. He didn't think that they deserved it. And he sure did, for sure didn't want to be the one to bring them that message. And so the story continues with Jonah leaving his hometown and going to, to Nineveh, right? No. The complete opposite direction to Tarshish, Tarshish, about as far away from God as he could get. Or so he thought. Jonah quickly learns that God is still in charge no matter where he goes, even out on the Mediterranean Sea. God sends a huge storm that bombards the ship that he has tucked away on. The sailors are terrified and they call out to their gods. They start throwing everything over that's not bolted down in an attempt to lighten the ship so that they would not sink. Now in the midst of all this, the captain of the ship goes down below deck and finds Jonah asleep. Hauls him out of bed and up onto the main deck, begging him to pray to his God for salvation. The prayers not working, the sailors cast lots, they roll dice to see who is to blame for this storm, to see which one of them is making the gods so angry. The dice indicate Jonah is at fault, and he spills it all out. He is running away from God, the God who made the heavens and the earth and the raging seas. 
The sailors begin to beg Jonah to tell them the solution to appease his God. And when Jonah says that they should just sacrifice him to toss him overboard, the sailors refuse. They try again to row back to shore. And when that fails, then and only then, do they pray to Jonah's God, the God of Jacob, for mercy as they pick Jonah up by his hands and feet and toss him out into the rolling waves. The instant that Jonah's body touches the water, the sea goes calm. This scares those sailors even more because they recognize the enormous power of the God that they have been fooling with. The sailors are impressed, no longer terrified by the sea, but stand in awe of God. Jonah's God, Jacob's God. This is the God that they then worship and offer a sacrifice to. It's not the end for Jonah. This is the part we probably all remember. God has called Jonah for a purpose, and even though he was trying to get as far away from God as possible, God was never that far away from him. The Lord sent that great fish to swallow Jonah up and protect him from the sea, and there Jonah waited for three days. And it is here, about halfway through the book of Jonah, that for the first time, Jonah actually speaks to God. From the belly of the grave I cried, Help! And you heard my cry. You threw me into ocean's depths, into a watery grave, yet you pulled me up from that grave alive. O oh God, my God. When my life was slipping away, I remembered God. And my prayer got through to you made it all the way to your holy temple. But I'm worshiping you, God, calling out in thanksgiving, and I will do what I promised I would do. Salvation belongs to God. And God hears Jonah's honest, fervent prayer. The very same God that Jonah had forsaken and tried to run from was there to save him in his time of need. God had mercy and compassion on Jonah. God could have let that fish just digest Jonah, but instead God speaks now to the fish and it deposits Jonah onto the seashore. God then speaks to Jonah a second time echoing God's initial instructions. Get up on your feet and get on your way to that city of Nineveh. Preach to them. They are in a bad way and I cannot ignore it any longer. This time obeying God's orders to the letter, Jonah heads straight for Nineveh. Nineveh now is a very big city it would take three days to walk across. Jonah enters the city, goes one day's walk, and proclaims, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. That's his sermon. Not the most inspiring of messages, but Jonah has done exactly what God asked of him. When you were a kid, did you ever do the very least that your parents asked of you? Like they may not have been specific enough in their instructions and when they said to go clean your room, you cleaned part of that room or you just shoved everything under the bed? I mean, the floor's clean, right? That's kind of what Jonah is doing here. God said go and deliver this message and that's the message that he does. Well, despite that this is the world's shortest sermon, the fact that there seems to be no compassion or empathy in this message, despite that there are no further instructions of what these Ninevites are to do next, we see that the Ninevites instantly listen. 
if only every message from God were received in such a way. The people of Nineveh listen, and they trust God. They proclaim a citywide fast and dress in burlap sackcloth to show their repentance. Everyone does this. The rich, the poor, the famous, the obscure leaders and followers, even the cows. The conversion is instantaneous. Everyone puts on sackcloth as they try to show God just how sorry they are for the way that they have been living. God sees what they have done, that they have turned from their evil lives. God changes God's mind about them. What God said God would do to overthrow them, God doesn't do. This response, this immediate reaction and repentance is inspiring. We see God changing God's mind. A different translation renders this as God repented, turned the other way. How often do we see those words in Scripture? The Ninevites' response to God is so great that God decides not to punish them. They were able to influence God because they believed in God's word to them and responded to God's calling. God displays mercy and compassion, giving the Ninevites a second chance, similar to the way that God has already given Jonah multiple chances to do what is right. And so, of course, our friend Jonah is happy that God's mercy is on display, right? Well, let's see. Eugene Peterson phrases the closing chapter of Jonah in this way, chapter 4 from the message. Jonah lost his temper. He yelled at God. God, I knew it! When I was back home, I knew this was going to happen. That's why I ran off to Tarshish. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, but rich in love, and ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. So God, if you won't kill them, kill me. I am better off dead. God says to Jonah, what do you have to be so angry about? But again, Jonah just left. He went out of the city to the east and he sat down to sulk. He put together this makeshift shelter of leafy branches and sat there in the shade to see what would happen to the city of Nineveh. God had mercy and compassion arranged for this broad-leafed tree to spring up. It grew up over Jonah to cool him off and to get him out of his angry sulk. Jonah was pleased, and he enjoyed the shade. Life was looking up. But then God sent a worm by dawn of the next day, the worm had bored into the shade tree and it withered away. The sun came up and God sent a hot, blistering wind from the east and the sun beat down on Jonah's head and he started to faint. And he prepared to die. He says, I am better off dead. God says to Jonah, what right do you have to get angry about this shade tree. Jonah said, plenty of right. It has made me angry enough to die. God said, what is this? How is it that you can change your feelings from pleasure to anger overnight about a mere shade tree 
that you did nothing to get. You neither planted nor watered it. It grew up one night and died the next night. So, God says, why can't I likewise change what I feel about Nineveh from anger to pleasure? This big city of more than 120,000 people who do not know right from wrong. And don't forget about the animals. Jonah ends right there. It ends with Jonah being a bitter and angry man, angry at his loving, merciful, and compassionate God for being loving, merciful, and compassionate to people that he thought didn't deserve it. It ends with Jonah and us left to ponder God's question. Why can't I change the way that I feel about Nineveh? In Jonah's mind, the way that the Ninevites had lived provided ample proof that God could not really love and forgive everybody. I bet there may be some people in each of our minds that come to mind we could substitute for the Ninevites. But we, along with Jonah, are not always able to connect the full story, the whole picture. It is hard for us to see outside of our immediate window or our outlook for the world into something so much bigger than we can comprehend. Pastor Todd Hobby writes, it never seemed to cross Jonah's mind that he had directly disobeyed God's command, but God continued to pursue him with persistent love. It never seemed to cross Jonah's mind that if God were unforgiving, as he wishes God to be towards the Ninevites, that God might have let him drown in the sea. It never seems to cross Jonah's mind that the pagan sailors on that ship who tried to spare Jonah's life at all costs were much more godlike than Jonah himself was. It never seemed to cross Jonah's mind that even the fish was more obedient to God's word than Jonah was. But perhaps these are exactly the things that are on Jonah's mind that make him so angry. Because through all of these episodes in his own life, Jonah has experienced, he has witnessed, he has felt and received God's overwhelming mercy and compassion. He knows God's character firsthand. And he knows that because the Ninevites have changed their ways, that God would change God's mind and offer to them the same mercy and compassion that Jonah was not ready to offer them. Jonah had hope, not positive hope, mind you, but Jonah had hoped that this time it would be different, that maybe this time Jonah's enemies would be God's enemies, that God would not offer the city of bloodshed and these Assyrians mercy and compassion. Should you be angry? God asks Jonah. Reverend Hobby writes, at least God remembered that God was merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, even toward a disagreeable person like Jonah. After all, we see that Jonah is more upset about the death of a shade tree than he was over 120,000 people and their animals. This story of Jonah, full of humor, and humanity, obedience, fear, and anger, closes with God's question hanging in the air. Should I not be concerned about you fill in the blank? 
Pastor Claudio Caravales proclaims, if we are able to believe that God is merciful and gracious, that God responds to prayers, then this must shape our belief, must shape our lives and guide our actions in this world. Should we not be concerned? Both we and Jonah are challenged to visit our core beliefs and check our daily practices. We are called to change. We must listen and react to God's word, like the Ninevites, and eventually like Jonah. We must show our concern for others. And we must let God be God. We must let God be as loving and merciful and compassionate to others as we believe that God is loving, merciful, and compassionate to each one of us. Amen. Let us join together in professing our faith using these words adapted from the Confession of 1967 found in our book of Confessions. We are created by God to be in a relationship with God that we may respond to the love of the Creator. God gave us life which runs through generations 
and in a wide complex of social relations. Lit is to be received with gratitude, a task to be pursued with courage. The Holy Spirit creates and renews the church and the community in which we are reconciled to God and to one another. God enables us to receive forgiveness as we forgive one another and to enjoy the peace of God as we make peace among themselves. In spite of our sin, God gives us the power to become representatives of Jesus Christ and his gospel of reconciliation to all humanity. We, the members of the church, are ambassadors of peace and seek the good of all humanity in cooperation with powers and authorities in politics, culture, and economics, fighting against injustices when these same powers endanger human well-being. Our strength is in our confidence that God's purpose, rather than our own, will finally prevail. You may be seated. Let us gather our hearts together in this time of prayer. We praise you, Holy One, for your amazing grace that sustains this world and the beauty of creation and your gracious presence that infuses life with beauty if we but look. We praise you, God of heaven, for you have redeemed us, healed us, and continue to restore our lives not only ours, but the life of this whole world. Wisdom of the universe, you bear the pain of your people. Grant us the gift of wisdom that we may discern your way and live justly and graciously amid the struggles of this world. For we know that you sent your son to seek out and to save what is lost. Hear our prayers on behalf of those who are lost or those who feel lost in the living of these days as we trust in your unending compassion. This morning we remember especially those that are grieving. This day, the family of Beth Severson who are grieving the loss of their mother. And others of us here on this day, grieving the death of family and friends. We lift up to you as well, those concerns that have been brought forward and so this day, we pray for Patricia and for Joyce, for Dick and Jeanne, for Carol and Gary, for Carolyn and Brian, and Pauline. We lift up to you as well our ongoing concerns and prayers for Matt and Maureen and Chet and Shirley, and Riley, and Don C. We continue in prayer for Brian, and for Greg, and for Kathy B. Hear us too, O Lord, as we lift up to you David, and Colin, and Hannah, Kevin, and Jane, and Leroy, and Kelly. And at this time, O oh Lord, we cannot help but remember our country, the world, and its many leaders. I'm reminded of the scripture that says when we cannot find the right words to pray, your spirit prays for us, for you know the need of this country, its leaders, the world, and its leaders. May all of them and may us be like the Ninevites who turned in repentance to you and your ways. We pray too for the church and the part that you have called us to be your light into this world. We bring to you also these concerns from our congregation, those that we pray for weekly.
Redeemer, sustainer, visit your people and pour out your strength and courage upon us that we may hurry to make you welcome, not only in our concern for others, but by serving them generously and faithfully in your name. For all this we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Whether we have much or only a little, we can share our daily bread so that all will be fed. As we have received, so now we give in the vineyard of the Lord our tithes and offerings. I've heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do ya? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the pastel king composing, hallelujah.
Let us pray together. God of the harvest, we are privileged to be counted among those whom you have called, grace to have been given your work to do, blessed to receive more than we ever earn. Accept, we pray, our thanksgivings and offerings, and do what you choose with what already belongs to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Everywhere and always. Amen. Um. 